Well, again, good morning, church. Nice to see everybody this morning. We, uh, let me tell you about how my, my morning started this morning. I went to the, the store yesterday and I bought a roll of cinnamon raisin bread. I love cinnamon raisin bread, but I have not had it in a long time. So this morning I got up and I made my coffee, and Natalia, she, she's still traveling. She's on her way back. But, so I made my coffee, and I uh, put in a couple slices in the toaster for cinnamon raisin toast. And can someone explain to me why cinnamon raisin toast, the makers of cinnamon raisin bread, do, make their loaves half the size of a regular loaf of bread? So when you put it in the toaster and the toaster pops, it doesn't stick up high enough to actually get it out of the toaster. And I'm fussing to get the two sides, and I burn my finger. And I know, first world problems, right? I know, I know. And then I sat down, and I'm having my coffee, and I'm having my toast, and I open up, and I'm reviewing my notes for this morning's message. And I come to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I think, I burnt my finger. Lord, you didn't have to hit me that hard with the two by four this morning to let me know that uh, my, my whining was a little overboard. So um, sometimes he does that. But this morning, I'm glad you're all here. We, um, like I said at the beginning, we have a big week ahead of us with VBS starting. So everybody kind of who's been involved in that, take a big, deep breath and exhale, and it'll be over before you know it. But we're going to have a great time with it, I think. I'm really looking forward to VBS this year. Um, in preparation for VBS, over the last couple months, we have been planning and transforming the church. You see this morning I'm, I'm preaching from a, a, a hallways in Babylon. Um, and, but we've been transforming the church, getting it ready, and there's a lot of work and a lot of effort that goes into, into this. And we are just um, prayerfully seeking uh, God's rewarding and God working through the, the hearts of the kids and all the people that are going to be volunteering into the, this week. And while this has been going on, we made some effort to try to get the adults kind of in the zone, if you would, for teaching the kids. And uh, our Wednesday night Bible study, we were looking at, took a break and looked at uh, Jeremiah 29, one of the, his letter to the exiles in Babylon, and things that he was telling them on how to thrive and how to how to live their lives while in Babylon. And um, we also, or I also this week selected a couple of videos from our Right Now Media. That are available. And I, if you if you have an account on our right now media, you can go out and underneath the First Baptist Church on our church page, uh, there are some pastors picks of some some videos and some uh, devotionals that uh, deal with the exile. And uh, so, if you get a chance and you you want to review some of those things, by all means, I highly recommend. Now, of course, our our VBS theme this week is Daniel's courage in exile, right? And my message this morning is going to look at that courage a little bit closer because the reality is, as Christians, we kind of live in exile today, even with all the freedoms that we have in America. And, you know, I, I'm retired Air Force, and several of the others here military experience or retired military. And like them, I'm proud to be an American, and, and I'm grateful for the heritage that our country has. But today we also need to understand and recognize that the America that many of us grew up in and know is different from the America that we know now. Some would say that we're now living in a post-Christian culture, which means that the Christian worldview is no longer the popular majority. As American Christians, we're, we're facing some important decisions as to who we are, who we're going to be, and how we're going to address the constantly changing culture that's around us. Some churches try to wipe out the culture. They'll, they'll thump their Bibles and organize their boycotts, and they'll, they'll gather in protest lines and, and have protest rallies and in these instances, the Christians are trying to do ministry in the old cultural mindset. They expect to be heard and respected. They expect to have the power. And they expect culture to fall in line with the leadership of the church. The problem is the culture is not listening anymore. 
some churches try to embrace the culture. The old saying is, well, if we, if we can't beat them, then let's join them. And that's echoed, and that has a tendency to, to lead to embracing unbiblical behaviors and, and lifestyles instead of standing on the scriptures and, and sound doctrine. And every denomination that has focused or embraced the culture has lost much of its spiritual power. I hope you'll agree with me on that. And when you try to wipe out the culture, you lose your relevancy. And when you try to embrace the culture, you lose your influence and position of strength. Neither one of them is correct. So what's the solution? We must relearn as a church how to engage our culture. We must relearn how to engage our culture from the edges instead of the center. And I say it because Christianity is no longer the center uh, in, in politics or in social circles. We're at the edge now. I've seen articles out there that say Christianity in America is dying. I don't believe it's dying. I believe it is being defined. Under the umbrella of American Christianity, you can, you can really categorize this into one of two categories. The nominal Christian and the convictional Christian. Convictional Christians are those who are actively pursuing a relationship with Jesus Christ. And their, their faith is seen in the way that they live their lives for Christ. Nominal Christianity is on the decline. Nominal Christianity is often defined as in name only. And that, that's not a term or a phrase that I particularly like, but that's the common term. And there are those who would identify as Christians, but don't really live or practice their faith. They may attend church sporadically or on holidays, but they, they really don't have a personal relationship with God. Though if you ask them, they'll say, oh yeah, I'm Christian. And what's happening in American Christian today is this. Those that are nominal Christians are becoming the nons. Before, these people would say, I ascribe to the Christian faith. Yeah, I'm a Christian. But now they say, I ascribe to no faith. Or all roads lead to heaven. So nominals are becoming the nons, and the convictional Christians are maintaining a fairly stable minority. So Christianity in America is, be, is becoming less nominal and more defined but sadly, more outside the mainstream of American culture. Just in the last 20 years, Christians have gone from having a lot of respect to general indifference to finally outright hostility in some cases. And the reality is this. I, I don't believe genuine Christianity is declining in America. But no one can deny that Christianity has, has lost the home field advantage. I use the terms nominal and convictional, but Jesus had terms for these, these, two, these two groups of people too. He called them the wheat and the tares. It's no easy thing to live a godly life in the midst of an increasingly godless society. But it can be done, and Daniel shows us how to be the wheat. While Daniel was living in Babylon, he didn't just survive, he actually thrived. And he changed an entire empire while he was at it. How did he do it? Daniel's incredible example of how to live in the most godless environment is the main lesson that we want to take away from this week. If you have your Bibles with you, would you turn with me to Daniel chapter 1? And while you're turning, I'm going to give you a, kind of set the stage for what's happening. The people of Israel, Daniel chapter 1. The people of Israel were living in terrible sin for generations. And prophets of God said, if you continue to live this way, God will remove his hand from your protection and allow the Babylonians to capture them and take them into captivity. They must repent. But sadly, the Israelites didn't listen. 
So from around 605 B.C. to 586 B.C., the Babylonians attacked Judah and Jerusalem, and they took several Israelites into exile in Babylon. And Daniel and his friends were, were part of one of the groups, and there were actually three groups that were taken into exile. And now they're, they're living in an evil and hostile environment, a place that they don't want to be, and their world has basically been turned upside down. They loved living in Jerusalem. Now you might be asking, well, what, what made Babylon so bad? Let's cover that. But first, they had a godless king. The Babylon king was, was uh, the king of Babylon was ne King Nebuchadnezzar. And we have a portrait of him here this morning as we prepare for our VBS. Um, Nebuchadnezzar, he was an egomaniac. He was a hothead. He was a murderer. He was just a bad dude. And he built this 90-foot statue, gold statue, as a tribute to his personal power and his success and his fortunes. He demanded that everyone bow down to it and worship it. Those who refused to were put to death. Another time, Nebuchadnezzar had a, a disturbing dream, and he asked all of his wise men to interpret it for him. But because he was so unreasonable and cruel, he wouldn't tell them what the dream was. He told them to figure it out on their own. And when they couldn't, he ordered his executioners to kill him. So, I have a dream, I want you to tell me what it was, and then I want you to tell me what it means. Oh, you can't? Okay, you're dead to me. That's what it was. Fortunately, before they could be killed, God revealed to Daniel both the dream and the interpretation which saved him and others from certain death. Babylon also had a false god religion and educational system. The religion of Babylon was a false god, and the core curriculum in their schools of higher learning included all kinds of false ideas and teachings. In order to prepare for service to the king, Daniel and his three friends were forced to complete a three-year study program. And this study program was designed to, to certify them and indoctrinate them into the Babylonian culture. The word indoctrinate is kind of a... a, a a name that we hear a lot these days, don't we? There are, there are many out there these days who are arguing that our centers of learning today are more like centers of indoctrination rather than uh, an effort to, and they are doing it in an effort to drive or shift change in our culture. The word indoctrination is a pretty popular word these days. Third, Babylon was a spiritually hostile environment. To make matters worse, Babylon hated the spiritual values that Daniel and his friends held. And one of the first things that they had to endure was a name change. The name Daniel means, God is my judge. But his Babylonian captors immediately changed his name to Belshazzar, which means servant of Bel. And Bel was the, the title of their de uh, demonic god, Marduk. Bel was to them what? Well, Lord would be to us. It would be like having the name changed from servant of the Lord to servant of Satan. The same thing happened to Daniel's three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Their names were changed to what? I said wrong. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? Their names were changed in an attempt to remove any connection to their homeland and to their God. It was Babylonians, it was the Babylonian way of forcing their captors to adopt a new identity and a new God. And then fourth, Babylon or Babylon was a, a place of callous indignity. Daniel and his friends would have likely suffered the indignity of castration and turned into eunuchs. Now, the scripture doesn't mention this, but Jewish history and, and ancient history does. In Bible times, it was very important for a man to have a family, especially sons, because they provided him with status and would help him in their business, provide a safety net for him. They didn't have 401ks back then, so they would have had to depend on their children to provide for them in their, their old age. Without sons, a family's portion of the promised land would be given to someone else. 
his name would basically fade with the passing of time. It would be as if they never existed. The family name would just die out. And that's why, why we see there's a lot of begats in the Bible. There was an emphasis on ancestry in the family lines. And when it comes to Daniel and his friends, there's no mention of a spouse or a family. Daniel describes in verse 4 the type of young men that were imported from Jerusalem to serve in Nebuchadnezzar's court. Daniel 1.4 says, Young men, without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. Now, obviously, these were not the kind of men the king would want hanging around his harem and his concubines. So to eliminate any problems and to remove any chance of a testosterone-driven uprising, the kings would just routinely have these men emasculated, turned into eunuchs. In fact, the man in charge of Daniel's training was himself a eunuch, the chief of the eunuchs. And by the way, this week, <clears throat> we're going to see that this, this chief of the eunuchs is an extremely handsome guy. And humble, too. I don't know about you, but when I consider all that Daniel had to deal with, my burnt finger, uh, I don't have much to complain about. And m most of us here in this room, or maybe all of us here in this room, probably don't either. All of our excuses about how hard it is to live for God today seem pretty lame. But to do it successfully and serve God, we need to adopt a few traits that we see in Daniel. The first is that we must be a people of conviction. From the very beginning of his time in Babylon, Daniel was tempted to compromise everything he learned and experienced in life. Daniel was now in a pagan land, a land that had no room for God and no time for God. For the first time in his life, he went to school that didn't begin with prayer. No longer were the Ten Commandments posted in the classroom. The very idea of God himself was rejected. Every effort was being made to indoctrinate Daniel and his friends into the pagan way of thinking and the pagan way of living. And after changing their names from names that had godly meaning to names that had pagan meanings, and then putting them into their educational system to do everything they could to change their minds, Daniel showed resilience because he knew who he was and what he believed. And the problems begin in verse 5, Daniel chapter 1, verse 5, because the king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. Now the king's meat and wine... They represent the sinful pleasures of the world. They were trying to get these young men, young men that, that came in exile to adopt this sinful lifestyle. And Daniel didn't mind going to their schools because he knew what he really believed. And he didn't mind being called by their new name because he knew who he really was. But he drew the wine at the king's meat and the king's wine. In verse 8, says, but Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. The reason why Daniel refused to eat the meat and drink the wine was this. First, two reasons actually. First, much of the food would have been forbidden by the dietary laws that God had given his people in the Old Testament. So the Israelites couldn't eat this stuff. But more importantly, the meat and the wine had been dedicated to some heathen god, in Daniel's mind. And to eat this food and to drink this wine would mean that, that he had to, or would be honoring this, this pagan god and pledging allegiance to this pagan god. Daniel simply refused to do it. Now parents, and our VBS teachers this week, I remind you that every day our kids are going to be hit with the hammer of compromise. 
The only thing that will stand against this wall or is the wall of convictions that parents try to cultivate in their children's hearts. Some parents take this responsibility seriously. Proverbs 22 reminds us in verse 6, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. But not all parents take this responsibility seriously. Some parents today, whether they're wheat or tear, doesn't matter, are letting situations and circumstances dictate. Their children are simply picking up on their convictions by watching how their parents act and respond in given situations. And it's not always good. While having a lot of fun this week, I, I hope we'll recognize the huge responsibility that we have with VBS this week. There are four most popular gods in America. The most popular god in America is self, the god of self, god of me, myself, and I. Second is the god of sex. Third is the god of sports. And fourth is the god of success. Let me tell you something I've discovered about Satan. Satan isn't interested in trying to get you to stop worshiping. Satan wants you to worship the wrong thing. He knows he can't get you to stop, so he wants you to refocus on something else other than God. We must be a people of conviction, but we must also be a people of character. Once your kids decide what convictions they believe, that will determine how they behave. The ESV version of the Bible says in verse 8, Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself. That's not incorrect. But here, I love the way the King James puts it. Daniel purposed in his heart. That's referring to his character. Character is all about heart. In my reading this week, I came across a, a quote that says, The heart of your character is the character of your heart. You are the person you are today because of the character you became yesterday. And the person you will be tomorrow is determined by the character that you have today. Daniel had a choice, and that choice not only revealed his character, but it shaped his character going forward. Let me tell you what I mean by character. Character is the will to do what is right as God defines what is right regardless of the consequences or the costs. I want you to see two things in that definition. The first is, character demands commitment to do what is right. This is one of the greatest lessons that we can teach kids. The best way to handle temptation is not to make a decision when you're tempted, but to make a decision about what you will do before you face the temptation. Character is simply doing what is right because it's the right thing to do. And second, character depends upon believing in an absolute standard of right and wrong. It is a matter of believing that certain things are right or wrong, regardless of how we may feel, what we may think, or what we may want. Right and wrong is defined by God, not by us. Now what I just said is completely counter to what the world would want us to believe today. The world says there's no absolute truth anymore. It's all relative truth. You have your truth and I have mine, and as long as they don't conflict, we can be friends. But if they conflict, well, you're just wrong. Get away from me. There's no future in that way of thinking. That's where our society seems to be at today, though. We must be people of conviction, and we must be people of character, and third, we must be people of courage. Daniel used one of the greatest words you can ever teach your kid to say, unless they're saying it back to you. No. But do you know why Daniel could say no? Daniel could say no because apparently his parents had taught him first to say yes. He could say no to the world because he first said yes to God. 
And even though this was a good decision and the right decision, the best decision, it was not an easy decision. It took tremendous courage for Daniel to say no. And verse 8 tells us, Therefore he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. It seems simple enough, right? But it really wasn't. In verse 10, we read what the chief said. The chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who assigned your food and your drink. For why should he see that you are in worse condition than the youths who are of your own age, so you would endanger my head with the king? He's basically telling Daniel, look, if I let you do what you want to do, you're not going to remain healthy. You're going to look poorly compared to the others. The king's going to notice and he's going to cut my head off. If what Daniel was asking for was granted, not only would the eunuch die, but Daniel probably would as well. To refuse to eat at the king's table was an insult to the king. To refuse a direct order was an act of disobedience, and either rebellion or refusal carried with it the penalty of instant death. In other words, when Daniel said no, he was putting his life on the line. And there was an even greater pressure that Daniel faced. It's the greatest pressure any kid faces, particularly a teenager today. And it's peer pressure. Because of the hundreds of Jewish teenagers that were there at the time, Daniel was the first, and at that point, the only one to say no. Can you imagine the conversation that went on? His friends were saying, come on, Daniel, everybody's doing it. And Daniel said, no, not everybody's doing it because I'm not doing it. Everybody else said, but Daniel, nobody will know. And Daniel said, God will know. And someone else said, Daniel, you've got to obey the king. And Daniel said, no, I've got to obey the God that my parents taught me to love. It takes conviction and character to say yes to God, and it takes unbelievable courage to say no to this world. Parents, you have to teach your kids to say no, but your, ter your teenagers have to learn to say no. You can't make them say no. I don't want you to sit there this morning and feel guilty or anything like that if, if you've got teenagers who haven't had the courage at the right time to say no. That's not my point. I'm one of those dads. I have a son who was unable to say no when he needed to. I know what you're going through. That's not my point this morning. But we have to make sure that we have modeled by our lifestyle, that we have the courage to say no, and then trust the Holy Spirit to guide our youth in his ways. After all we've done, and done all that we can do to teach them. I'm going to jump forward now in Daniel to chapter 6. There's a story of Daniel being put to the lion's den because he, he's pushing back on the king's laws. When telling this story, people usually focus on Daniel's courage while in the lion's den. But what's oddly missing from this story is any description of Daniel's experience in the den. Not one word. 153 verses on his life before the lion's den. But other than telling the king that God had shut the mouths of lions, there are zero verses describing him in the lion's den. Why is that? It's because Daniel's courage and faith in the lion's den isn't the point. Think about it for a minute. Shutting the mouths of lions was God's thing. God did that. Once Daniel was thrown in the lion's den, there wasn't very much he could do about it. Daniel's courage and faithfulness was shown in the way he lived that got him thrown into the lion's den. His courage and faithfulness was shown in the way he lived that got him thrown into the lion's den. The real miracle was when his enemies were looking for a way to accuse him, but they couldn't find anything in his life. So they made up a law forbidding prayer to anyone but the king. And Daniel still prayed. 
That's real courage. That's real faith. And it was that courage and that faith that became the this, this setup for God's display of faithfulness. I think most young Christians today, no matter your age, and young in your, your maturity, in your Christian walk, I, I think most young Christians want to see God do huge things in their life. They want to see Him come through for them in big ways. They want God to reveal through them that he's still a God who can accomplish the impossible. They want to see God. They want authenticity. But many Christians will will never have the opportunity to prove God's faithfulness in the lion's den because they haven't proved their faithfulness in their everyday life. They're not going to see God come through for them in some huge financial way because they haven't learned to trust him with what they've been given. They're not going to see increased favor at work because they segregate God from work. They're not going to see God use them in powerful ways at school because they live in such a way that no one even knows that they believe in God when they're at school. Don't try to be like Daniel in the lion's den. Be like Daniel who prayed every day and had integrity before he was. That's why he was put in the lion's den. Be like Daniel and serve God continually in every aspect of your life before your lion's den moment. Have courage and faith to live in such a way that God actually has a platform. You, us, all of us, which he shows his faithfulness through us. And then God will do his thing, his lion's den thing, for others to see. We must also be a people of courtesy. There is a trait here in this event that a a lot of people miss, I think. And that is that Daniel, even though he stood his ground, he didn't do it arrogantly, he didn't do it rudely, he did it courteously. I said earlier he learned to say no, but he really learned tact. Listen to verses 11 through 13. Then Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let let our appearance and the appearance of the youth who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants accordingly on what you see. Did you notice what Daniel did? He didn't stage a protest. He didn't firebomb the banquet hall. He didn't threaten the king or the eunuch. He just said very quietly and graciously, I propose an alternative. Daniel had been taught to be respectful to authority, and and if you see a problem... Don't just bring it to light. Don't just start spouting off your issues or your concerns. Tactically have a proposed plan to fix it. An alternative. Bring something to the table. Bring something to the discussion. Young folks, better here. I know I know it sounds like I'm bagging on you, and I'm not. I promise I'm not. I tell you, it's the same for all younger generations. I was arrogant and disrespectful in my youth. Once. Okay. But listen to these words. Our youth love luxury. They have bad manners, contempt for authority. They show disrespect for their elders. Youth are now tyrants, not the servants of their households. They no longer rise when their elders enter the room. They contradict their parents, gobble up their food, and tyrannize their teachers. You know who said that? Greek philosopher Socrates in 400 B.C. Some things seemingly never change. But I'm simply saying it doesn't have to be that way. And every next generation can learn so much from those that came before them and after them. If all the generations 
would willingly humble themselves and be courteous. The Apostle Peter instructs us, he says, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. That's being courteous to one another, folks. God calls us to live holy and distinctly. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, the apostle wrote, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Realize that you don't have a job. All of you that are working these days, you're going to get up and go to work tomorrow morning. That's a job, yes, but you have a ministry assignment. Daniel is a great example of someone who saw his job as a ministry assignment. He and his friends consistently viewed themselves as servants of God. Maintaining a similar perspective is one of the keys to being an influence. Remember that God's in control. We see that right out of the gate in Daniel chapter 1, verse 2. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hands. God decides what's going to happen. If you want to become influential, become invaluable. Daniel became invaluable. In verse 20 of chapter 1. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them, Daniel and his friends, ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all of his kingdom. And he also said in, in Daniel chapter 6, verses 3 through 5, Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for a complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for a complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any ground for a complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God, in his relationship with his God. Why is all this important? Because Jesus hasn't called us home yet. And like the prophet Jeremiah, he told the exiles in his letter to them in chapter 29 of the book of Jeremiah, he says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent. Again, God did this. I have sent them into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. He tells them, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. And take, take wives for your sons and, and give your daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where you have sent, where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, in the city's welfare, you will find your welfare. We have a life to live here now. But as George Orwell has said, the further a society drifts from truth, the more it will hate those who speak it. We're seeing that today, folks. This is God's absolute truth. And the more we speak it, the more we're hated. Have the conviction, character, courage, and courtesy of Daniel. These traits that led him to being placed in a lion's den. But he was saved by God. And he also changed an empire. Live that kind of life, Daniel kind of life today, as we engage our community and seek to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. You join me in prayer. Father, our VBS is this week, and we thank you for this opportunity to share good news with children in our church and the community. We know that our, our best efforts cannot make lasting change.
We need your power to truly change these young lives and, and potentially their families. We pray that every volunteer would be sensitive to the leading of your spirit. Give them words to speak and actions that convey your love. Give them a spirit of teamwork and unity. We ask that you would open the hearts of the children to the powerful message of the gospel. We pray for the children who, who do not know you as Father or your Son as Savior. And may they receive the message and be changed. And we also pray for the children who, who don't know your love. May they grow even deeper in it. And Father, finally, we, we ask that these children who, who come next week be a catalyst for revival. And through their newly gained knowledge of you, may they convict the hardened hearts of adults in their lives who have turned from you or, or maybe don't know you. And may this week give you glory. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.